very honored today to have as our guest, uh, Dr. James Banks, and welcome. And could you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I'm a professor of education at the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, I really train teachers, and my latest research deals with these issues around the world. I just got back from South Korea, uh, keynoting a conference on diversity and education. So my work is focusing on these issues, comparing how diversity in the United States and other nations uh, is developed and dealt with in schools and colleges and universities. Great. Um, I always feel that you have been a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in, in this higher education thing for over 30 years. So it says something about you, OK? Um, and sometimes people refer to you as the father of model cultural education. How, how do you feel? when you're addressed in that. In well, that I always find it a little humorous, <laughs> particularly in a recent article uh, that I was interviewed for a journal mm. in um, Europe, and the editor referred to me as the grandfather ah, of multicultural the education. the grandfather. And I said, I think you got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's the father of. Right. Oh, it, it's a bit humorous, because I think there are many of us who contributed, mm. um, such as Geneva Gay or uh, Carl Grant, many of us contributed to the beginnings. Uh, I find that a bit of humorous and a, a title that I have, but I don't fight it. I just mm -hmm. let, let people use it. Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that and the changes that you've seen um, in the past 40 years um, in this field, because I, I remember early on when it was certainly fledgling, yes. there wasn't a whole lot of us out there that were driving these issues, but it, it certainly has uh, developed and evolved. Yeah, it's evolved, but it, I call it cyclic, because mm -hmm. um, even though it's evolved, as you know, many of us started out in black studies or uh, depending on our ethnic group, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Latino studies, and it's evolved. In my own case, I started out in black studies. My first book was called Teaching the Black Experience. Mm -hmm. My next book was called March Toward Freedom, A History of Black Americans. So in my own evolution, I kind of evolved from black studies to ethnic studies. One of the first books right. I edited was uh, uh, Teaching Ethnic Studies right. for the National right. Council for the Social Studies. And then I expanded to multicultural education, which began to look at gender and s uh, sexual orientation issues. But I, I see it as cyclic because even though we are becoming institutionalized, there's always a struggle when, when you're dealing with folks of color, when you're dealing with marginalized groups. And not only in my own university, uh, where Jenny Vigay and I are, mm -hmm. but it's continual. We can never rest easy that mm -hmm. if we walked away that our courses would stay there. Mm -hmm. We have to really uh, keep struggling because fortunately we've hired uh, many uh, faculty of uh, a number of faculty of color, yeah. um, including some African Americans, but also other ethnic groups and white brothers and sisters who are committed mm -hmm. to these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So that we have more more on the faculty now, but it's still a struggle to to keep a diversity um, going in these universities and in schools because there are always challenges and questioning of whether it's legitimate. So it's a it's a continuing struggle, even though we've approached institutionalization. And with my latest book, which is the four-volume Encyclopedia of Diversity in Education, when Sage asked me to do that, it was also uh, to keep it institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And that's the same reason that I edited the Handbook of Research in mm -hmm. Multicultural mm -hmm. Education in 1995. Right. That's when the first edition appeared. So it's cycling, and it's a continuing struggle. Yeah. Now, is that because the hegemic or master narrative is so powerful? Is, is it we're, we're constantly trying to resist its inroads? I think that's part of it, but I think it's, uh, it's basically that the people in power mm. who control curriculum, mm. control textbooks, see in part as a reaction to the growing demographics. I mentioned in my lecture this morning that the United States is about one-third people of color and um, will be about one half at mm -hmm. 2050. Right. So I think the people in control see that growing, and if you look at the election of Obama, mm -hmm. they see that is a kind of the last fight at the gunfight at mm -hmm. O.K. Corral, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. this, that the barbarians are coming mm -hmm. and they're going to take over. <laughs> that, that, so I think there's a great um, 
hysteria mm -hmm. about what it's going to mean mm -hmm. when that we have that many demographically uh, ethnic folks. So I think part of it is a reaction mm -hmm. to the growth of the people of color in their population. But part of it is we want to stay in control, mm -hmm. and the curriculum is uh, one of the re ways we keep yeah. control. I think Carter G. Ruth, G. Woodson said if you really capture a man's brain, you don't have to tell him to go to the back door. So I think part of the hegemonic power structure mm -hmm. is let's keep our image of the world right. and, and that for that keep people in their place. Yeah. So I think it's a complex issue. Mm -hmm. But I think it's basically let's keep our power because the, these folks outside are threatening uh, our power. I thought we clearly saw that if we look at the who participated and who voted for Obama. We right. saw that. Uh, the, 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 he won that election in part because of white women, mm. younger people, mm. and folks mm. of color. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. And what is frightening is looking at that electoral map and seeing how divided this nation yeah. really is. Yeah. Because once you get outside those urban areas and then yeah. spotted areas where largely their universities or military bases, um, it's a pretty red map. Yeah. 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 Um, so. What's it going to take for us to connect back? You know, um, I, I know you like to talk about this notion of humanity and the importance of us, you know, learning to be human beings. So, what what's what's that process like to move toward that kind of humanity? Well, I think I'm going to quote Sandra Harding. I think we got to not only talk about human rights, but we got to talk about power. And I think Sandra Harding talks about strong objectivity. And she said objectivity has been defined as white, male, mm -hmm. with people with property, you know, just from the Constitution on. Oh, yeah. And those are the people who've structured objectivity. Mm -hmm. They've structured uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. They've structured the curriculum in the schools and the universities. And Sandra Harding said we need to construct a strong objectivity. Mm -hmm. And by that, she means black folks, folks from different sexual orientations, women, uh, got to sit at the table mm. and help to re reformulate, reconceptualize a new America. Mm. We, the old America is not functional, mm. where we go and you know, fight wars that we shouldn't be fighting. Mm. And that's why I'm, I'm so glad to see Obama resisting the pressure to go to war about Syria. He's right. really right. resisting that, and he's trying to form multinational uh, coalitions. I think that is the future, not that we are the police and we are the rule of the world. I think Obama has it right that it's coalitions, and, it, and coalitions also within the nation, coalition across nation. That's how I think we have to rethink America. We have to rethink the world, and we have to involve those nations, uh, uh, such as Iraq, such as black Americans, such as people with different so sexual orientations, in the conversation mm -hmm. as we reformulate who we are and we reformulate the new world that we're going to live in the end. So I think we have to reconstruct America. We have to reconstruct the world by developing a kind of strong objectivity and a new development of the nation and the world that's participatory, that people and power is shared. Mm -hmm. And I think the people with power are going to have to share power. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for them to be afraid, but I think that the, we're going to have to, they're going to have to share power. And I think the only way we can reconstruct the nation in, in the global world. Yeah. And, and it really is about fear, isn't it? Fear and, and loss, loss of power. Yeah. 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 And, lo and sharing of power. So I don't think, I think we need to re rethink, I think the people with power have to rethink that we're not going to lose power, but we do have to share it. Yeah. It, 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 it's always been fascinating to me, this notion of fear. Uh, because it seems to be that almost a paralysis mm -hmm. that this nation has um, and has always felt, uh, especially by people of color. Yes. Uh, there was always a fear that they would take over the plantations and treat the, the slave owners like they treated the slaves and stuff. Um, but we have but class has also been a major factor. Yeah. Just reading a new book in the Teachers College Press series I edited on race and class. Mm -hmm. and what happened in the South, I'm a black Southerner, mm -hmm. uh, even though I live in the West, mm -hmm. now I'm still a black Southerner. And the poor whites, if you really looked at it, weren't much better off than no. we were. Right. But the people, the whites with power, uh, taught them to use race where they could feel better than we were. Right. 
when objectively our situation weren't that different. Mm -hmm. So the cl class was used to divide and conquer, if you will, mm -hmm. to keep the, the poor whites thinking they were better than we were mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't form coalition with us in order to improve all of our conditions. Right. So class is also a major factor, not just race. Mm -hmm. And they intersect and interact. So I, I think see. we also have to understand how class has been used to divide and keep people separate. When, right. when our interests, the poor whites were in my black southern the, the southern community mm. were just as poor as we were, and I didn't understand that mm. at the time. Okay. Um, we've been talking about closing the achievement gap in, in America, and obviously we interpret that differently depending on positionality of one looking at the problem. Is it an achievement gap or is it an opportunity gap? Well, I think Gloria Latson Billing has rethought this as an opportunity gap that it's uh, also I think this this gap notion really kind of often diverts attention away from the real problem because the gap notion often put the focus on the victims mm -hmm. of oppression mm -hmm. not of the perpetuators of oppression mm -hmm. those who keep us oppressed so I think we need to rethink that as not only an opportunity gap but the kind of um, forces that have kept people outside of the system structurally excluded and then they become blamed for their families mm -hmm. for their homes mm -hmm. for their poverty so I think we need to really reconceptualize that as what kind of structural changes that are needed in the system rather than just to focus on the problem of those who are victimized so I think the the, the uh, achievement gap put the focus on the victims of the people who haven't had the opportunities so I think that that needs to be rethought and, and reconceptualized. Okay. Um, you kind of mentioned earlier, and um, I'm interpreting it in my own framework here, that uh, America's schools through the early stages were largely assimilation type factories. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were um, bringing the many into one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems that that model has outlived its usefulness. Well, it's obsolete now because um, there is no one model American. There is no one model British. The world is changing so drastically mm. where the world has millions of immigrants, millions of people moving across borders so that we have to have citizens mm. who are able to think as, as people with a global consciousness and not just as Americans because our fates are so intimately mm. tied. I just heard a lecture, I was in North Korea last week, I heard a lecture from a woman from Japan, and she was pointing out how uh, at least a large percentage, if not half, of what you think of as Japanese mm. a ja uh, production, such right. as Toyota and Sony, are made in nations other than Japan. Right. That, that a lot of the Toyotas are made in, in Georgia right, or, right. or Arkansas, or, that that we can't think in national terms anymore. And people who said, buy American, because what you think is American may have been made uh, in, in, in um, China or in Beijing. So that we have to educate citizens to have a respect for their own culture, but also to live in a world that, that, that's a globalized world, mm -hmm. where the jobs in India are, are, are often been shipped from the United States. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why we have unemployment in Detroit, mm -hmm. so that we have to think of this as a, a globalized society. Mm -hmm. So educating people to think, to eradicate them of mm -hmm. their culture, to make them American, or to make them British, or to make them Chinese, is obsolete. Right. It's inconsistent with the world. Right. That's why I think Obama is such a, a world-class politician, because mm -hmm. I think having lived in Indonesia, having uh, understood the world, that's why he's trying to create multi uh, national coalitions and I think that th that's the way of the future and it's really the brilliant way and the effective way that we have to rethink not just educating people who are citizens of the United States but people who can function on the world stage who have a global c consciousness and to understand the because the world issues are are not national anymore right. they're, they're, they're ex they are beyond national boundaries right. and the solutions are beyond national boundaries most of the world's problems, such as pollution, such as poverty, take, are going to take global solutions. Okay. Um, as a former fifth grade teacher, I, I know that about your history. Yeah. Um, 
What would your challenges be now with No Child Left Behind, shrinking the, the, the curriculum, shrinking opportunities for what I think is real learning and real teaching? What do teachers do now to try to prepare students to live in this global world that you just described, given all, all these fetters they have to, One to deal with? One of the things to keep out, uh, before I answer that, I'd just like to give a little background. One of the things that's happening, I taught at the Francis Parker School in Chicago, which is an independent school, and I could bet you that Parker is still teaching their kids to think, because mm -hmm. they come from upper middle class. Right. They're teaching them to, to be critical, mm -hmm. Whereas it's in the lower class poverty schools in Chicago where it's test and drill. Right. So we see a real class differentiation yes. that the, the upper class and the rich are teaching their kids to think, to be critical. Right. Whereas in the lower class schools, it's drill and kill. Right. So, it's the, so the challenge for teachers in poverty schools or working class schools is how to resist some of the drill and kill to teach our kids to think. Yes. So I think that's the big challenge. And it really is a social class variable, depending on where you are. And, um, and so it, it is the poor kids who are getting the drill and kill, and the middle class and upper middle class kids, or who are, and I can bet you at Parker, they're still teaching, because the parents are demanding oh, yeah. it, teaching the kids to think. So if you are a teacher in a low income school, the challenge is how do you resist some of this mm. testing, which is, Often testing is, re is replacing teaching. Yeah. And, and so it's a real uh, uh, concern of mine. Um, and, and it's going to be difficult to resist. Although in a local school in Seattle and in Garfield, the teachers refuse to give the test. Mm. And, and it seems, so I think we need, we need grassroots movement. We need community movements. We need to educate communities about what, the, what is happening. And I do think we need to try to resist it. Right. Um, How do we get at those politicians that still want to demand that this is the way that we we can prove that we're doing something in them. Well, it's our, you know, a difficult process, but mm -hmm. ultimately I think the community has to mobilize and get rid of them. Uh, that we need to bring community pressure, but we need to educate communities about what's happening with this drill and kill. And I think the politicians are going to have to have to be accountable mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. And I think we have to demand it even of our liberal politicians such as Obama, we have to put the pressure. Right on people like Duncan, that, that, that this is not what we see as education. Yeah. Is that a production of the um, uh, capitalism? Is, is capitalism driving this in terms of, you know, schools being corporate, corporately funded now and, and yeah, driven by the... Yeah, I think that's part the, of it, but uh, remember that it's not just capital, capitalism is a factor, yeah. but it's a world factor because in China, the pressure is also on to test. And although ironically, China and Japan and Korea are moving away from testing to teach their kids how to think, and we are doing just the opposite. So yeah, one of the factors is capitalism. A lot of the testing is profit for the capitalists. If you look at companies such as Pearson, so yeah, that is a factor. And it's capitalism not only in the United States, but it's capitalism even in in Marxist countries, uh, socialist countries such as China, which is ironic. Um, China is, have many, believe it or not, Mao Zedong would roll over in his grave, mm -hmm. but Beijing now has a large number of billionaires. Mm -hmm. So the capitalism is a worldwide phenomenon, not just limited to the United States. So I think it's important that we understand how capitalism is a world factor that, and that it is one of the reasons that we have the testing in the schools and the testing of teachers. Um, uh, that, 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 that is a factor, but I think there are other factors also. I want to still um, talk about preparing students to live in a global society. Uh, and even though we know that's important, and I think most people intuitively know that, but, but our actions don't necessarily speak to that reality. And certainly one of those issues is language. Mm -hmm. um, here we are, this very powerful military economic nation that is still largely monolingual with the exception of the immigrants who come to us who speak a variety of languages. Why are we still so monocultural? I think there are many complex reasons that we're still monocultural and also monolanguage. I think one of the factors, first of all I should say 
that that position of big monolingual is going to be increasingly disadvantageous in the, in the future. Without a doubt. As China emerges mm -hmm. as a powerful nation and as um, Latin America emerges, um, as Brazil emerges. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is going to become increasingly uh, difficult to maintain leadership being monolingual. But I think there are many reasons that we are monolingual, one of which I think is geographical uh, isolation mm -hmm. in terms of interacting with other people. For example, I took French for six years, and yet my French, because I have little opportunity to practice mm -hmm. it, is, um, de is, is very low. Mm -hmm. And when I go to Paris and stay a few uh, month or so, it begins to come back. So part of the reason that we're monolingual, I think, is just the, the, the lack of opportunity to interact with right. other people. So I think one of the uh, ways that we, whereas in Europe, you're moving um, constantly right. among other nations, and English becomes a way that the different European nations can communicate. I think another reason is just attitude, mm -hmm. arrogance toward, toward other languages. Because English is the lingua franca, franca of the world, that we become uh, uh, just kind of uh, arrogant mm. that we only need to speak English. But that's going to change because I think if our, my, my daughters, when they were getting ready to go to school to, to take languages, they say, Dad, which language should we take? And that was about 20 years ago. And I said, take Spanish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't take French because that's the emerging uh, nation. Today I would say uh, take Mandarin <laughs> and Spanish. Uh, so that I think that it's a, it's a matter of time mm -hmm. that I and other nations are working hard to make their their students bilingual. Yeah. In China, uh, kids are learning, uh, of course, Mandarin and English, and so uh, I think the days are numbered where we we can just be monolingual. Yeah. Here, here's a, a problem that I've always wondered, and and it goes along with what what we've been talking about, but. Um, once again, we would recognize in the world that the metric system is the measuring system for probably 98% of the planet. Even in China, I just got yeah. back from, I go to China to lecture every September. So why haven't we been able to, to make yeah, that, that transition? That, I'm, do you, you're probably too young to remember when we tried. I did, I do, I, tried, I do remember. And we said yeah. it was too hard. Yeah. <laughs> and we I, gave up. Yeah. I, I think, again, it was arrogance. Yeah. I think that we said, you know, make the world change. But on that one, we lost. Because when we go to, when I land in, landed in Korea last week, you know, they were using the metric system. When I was in Europe in March, the metric system. So we, 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 we've lost that battle, and we, we're going to have to learn if our kids are going to be really mm -hmm. competent to function. Mm -hmm. I still want to play around with this a little bit more because I, I think it's reflective of, you, you called it arrogance. Um, hegemony. Hegemony uh, and stuff. That rigidity to change yeah. and the rigidity to embrace world culture uh, again. But people um, tend, cultures tend not to embrace other culture until they see it in their interests. Yeah. The only reason the people in Beijing are learning English is they think they can, they need it okay. to get power. Okay. And so it's only when the United States sees itself as needing to maintain its power to learn other languages, will it? So nation, if you look uh, around the world, they don't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to learn English <laughs> because I love the mirror. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's all pragmatic. Yeah, uh, it's only when nations see it in their self-interest uh, do they learn other languages or embrace, embrace other culture. Them. So it's not just Americans, because mm. we have to understand, we have to look at it globally. Uh, the English do the same thing. They're about as monolingual oh as we are. Yes. Because they yes. have, because they, you remember, they conquered the globe, practically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, the sun never mm -hmm. shown them uh, in, uh, on their, uh, never, never said, uh, yeah. never said yeah. on their empire for a long time. So they are now dealing with the loss of empire. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, they are beginning to learn other languages. So nation states, I think we have to get out of an American frame, but it's nation states don't make those changes till they have to, till they sit in their, their interests. Okay. And, and only will when we see it in our interests will we, Will, will we make the change? When we lose enough wars, uh, as we did in Iraq and, and, and other places, will we begin to see that we need people who understand Muslim cultures and, and who understand Muslim languages? Will we begin to change? Because it's in our self-interest. That's how nations begin to change when they sit. Not out of goodness. Okay. I don't think we ever, I mean, people don't change because of goodness. Okay. They change and maintain their power and to get more power. If we look at nations around the world. 
Yeah. Uh, that famous quote from De Bo uh, uh, Frederick Douglass mm. about when people change, it's, it's, it's when they, they need to get power and, and, the, and that's when they, they make changes. Right. I, I, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, we're, I think in terms of the world right now, we're kind of in an in interesting place. We have all these forces that, that we've been talking about here that are at work in ways nobody could have calculated, yeah. you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, technology is racing ahead. How do we help children navigate these immense changes, especially in social media, as, as an example, um, so that they can make sense of the world, so that they can um, uh, not have to, to deal with the obstacles that, that are surely going to arise as, as a result of, of these real dynamic well, technical changes? Well, that's why I think we have to, because of these rapid changes, mm -hmm. We have to teach kids, as I said in my lecture, to know, to care, and to act. We have to teach them to, to be able to change and to make changes that are significant in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, m many young people are going to have several careers in their yeah. life. So we have to teach them the skills that they need to cope with change. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you arrive, in, as I arrived in South Korea last week and as I arrived in London uh, in March, I had to understand that uh, I was, that my identity as an American had to be modified to deal with living in these different places mm -hmm. because I couldn't have a rigid attitude. I had to eat Korean food, I mean, you know, and I don't like all of it, just as they don't like all of ours. Right. But if I was going to survive in Seoul for five days, I had to eat some things I wasn't used to eating. Mm -hmm. And I had to deal with um, trying to listen to an interpreter mm. at times, that I had to, to be uh, um, pliable, mm. that I had to understand that I can't be hege uh, hegemic, that I had to be flexible and open, and I had to change. So I think we have to ki teach kids to deal with change, to, to be flexible, to, to, uh, to, to think deeply about issues, and to and now I think we'll be okay. I think they need to learn how to, how to care about others, how to think. See, the, that's why I think we need to teach them to think right. and not just to memorize right, math right. skills because their world will, will be changing and they will be dealing with Korean Americans and they'll be dealing with people from Iraq, even in their own nation. And what I was gonna say earlier, I think that even though we're isolated in the United States in terms of language, we have tremendous rich diversity yes. in our immigrant population. Yes. We have many languages in our school districts. So I think the laboratory for learning different languages, learning other cultures, um, the United States is so enriched by its diversity that that's an advantage over some nations, that we have this tremendous diversity. Mm -hmm. we have, in Seattle, we have Koreans, we have people from uh, India, we have people all over the world that provides our youngsters a rich opportunity to learn and practice of the languages, to learn and practice of the values. Right. And I think the school isn't, should take advantage of these immense opportunities. Right. Right. That are pro that's a laboratory yeah, I, for, for learning about these differences. I, I, I've often wondered why there are more dual language yes. you know, opportunities where rather than seeing children with deficits, I've, you have a deficit because you don't speak English as a first language, that should be an asset exactly. that um, could be helpful in our children learning their language exactly. as they learn And, and in maintaining language. their language, mm -hmm. as I forgot mm -hmm. most of my French. Mm -hmm. The kids can learn Mandarin and they can practice mm -hmm. it in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the Chinese community. Yeah. So I think that's the richness of the United States. As a matter of fact, our diversity has enabled us to be ahead of many nations because I don't know if you realize it, but Japan, I'll stay with Japan as an example, it's also true in South Korea, are not producing enough new babies mm. to maintain its population. Mm. So that Japan in 50 years will have a decrease in population. Mm. The same thing is happening in South Korea and in, but in Italy of all places, which is a, Catho a you know, a, been a Catholic nation. Mm -hmm. But the birth rates in these nations is so low mm. And Japan is refusing to let in many immigrants. Mm. So that Japan has to do something mm. or it's going to 
disappear in the long no. run. Right. So what has kept America, what has kept our population viable? Immigrants, yeah. and primarily Latino immigrants. The most of the birth, blacks are not growing in America. Yeah, right, right. We're maintaining. Yeah. Whites are not growing, right. decreasing right. slightly. Right. Right. Blacks are maintaining. What's growing, the U.S. population are Latinos. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be growing. Right. And we'd have the same problem as South Korea and Japan. Japan and South Korea are now advertising and making incentives for people to have babies. Right. And that's a complex reason. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have time to get into it in the interview, but there's some complex reason that the women in Japan and South Korea aren't having babies. Mm -hmm. Part of it is they aren't having many babies. They don't want to be like their mothers mm -hmm. who served. And no. I was in uh, Japan many years ago, and the, the wife never sat down with us for dinner. Right, right. She spent all of her time preparing and serving. Mm -hmm. And the young Japanese w uh, women are saying, I don't want to be my mother. Anyway, there's a real problem of birth rate in these countries. And what's a kept our birth rate viable and kept our, uh, therefore, a gross national product viable mm. is immigration. Wow. That's, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's what's kept us you viable. You certainly don't hear that in the news. That's a very <laughs> important factor wow. as you look at the world issues. That's very interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's kept us viable, kept mm. our population mm -hmm. young, and, and growing and viable. Yeah. It's the it's immigration. Well, and I've always thought we've been able to capture the genius of all these people from Einstein, all these different places. There's, you know, we, yeah, we, Einstein. Yeah. And of course, if we had had Iraqan sitting at the table of the Iraq war, I have a feeling we wouldn't have made some of the mistakes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree with that one. That we made mistakes. Um, you learn a language, you learn another culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're so mono, monolingual like we are, there's a lot we're about the world. Yeah, we're impoverished. We're impoverished. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um, you've been fairly prolific in, in your career uh, in terms of your own writing and then facilitating the, the writers um, that have uh, come through your shop in, in various kinds of ways. Um, what's exciting? What's, what's, uh, what's, what's some new books that are exciting? That you, that you're well, well, you know, every day in this business, to keep going for 40 yeah. plus years, you have to, first of all, believe you can make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to be excited about something. Yeah. I see many people at the university at my age turn bitter. Mm. They, they turn bitter. And my thesis is you have to reinvent yourself. Mm. You have to um, get new colleagues, because there are people in my generation who are, be who are sick, beginning to die, and and and. and so you have to think, what can I do to reinvent myself? Mm -hmm. And I think my work from going from black studies to multi ethnic education to multicultural education and now to the global issues mm -hmm. has kept me excited. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at, uh, when I go to Korea, I've just been invited uh, to the Middle East and, and looking at those issues. That's what keeps me, I think we have to, to keep going at my stage of life, in the winter of our lives, mm -hmm. we have to keep active, we have to keep our brain Energize, mm -hmm. and so I'm excited about my new work. Of, uh, I hope I'll make write my magnus opus, which I hope will be a comparative studies of how different nations deal with diversity, mm -hmm. how they wrestle with it, how they struggle with it, and how they begin to uh, resolve it. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, each new nation for me is a new, a new, uh, a new excitement. Mm -hmm. And so every morning I wake up excited about my new work. And also my other big agenda in my, the winter of my career is training m new PhD students. Mm -hmm. I'm, my, I'm now training in PhD students from, ch from Beijing, from South Korea. As a matter of fact, one of the exciting things about the conference last week that I gave the opening keynote address to in Seoul, Korea, is that one of my PhD students from Seoul came with me mm -hmm. and she gave a session uh, in Seoul, Korea. So mentoring this new group of students. I have 12 PhD students I'm not gonna take any more. Uh, I want to get those out and then uh, uh, see, so producing the next generation and then writing my magnus opus, uh, that, that's what keeps me going and exciting. Yeah. Do you keep count? Do you know how many you have had, how many PhD students you have? No, I really haven't counted them, but I, yeah. I'm excited that Tyrone Howard is at UCLA. He's one of my students. He has a best-selling book in my series, Awesome uh, Sensoi from Canada has a best-selling book in my series. Um, I haven't counted them, but, but I know that they, they're making a great difference yeah, in excellent. the world. Excellent. Not only here, but in other nations. Okay. 
Um, in terms of new scholarship, um, obviously you're looking at these these global issues and, and the importance of them. What's beyond that? You know, as you kind of have this opportunity now to reflect in your winter years, as you so nicely described that, um, what do you what do you think the the next big thresholds are going to be for I think, us? I think it's going to be how do we create a world in which people have what our own call flexible citizenship, mm -hmm. and they can move in and out of spaces, and see 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 U.S. hegemony and Western hegemony. I have to think we have to. I think it's time that we we have to think of a time when we won't be. Uh, the, the necessarily the dominant right. nation, right. but there will be dominant nations, and I think we'll be one of them. Mm -hmm. But there'll also be China, there'll be um, the Middle East, there'll be nations there. Mm -hmm. That we have to think about how do we educate kids for a world in which Western hegemony is shared mm -hmm. with uh, hegemony from other nations. I think China is, I, as I said, I, t I teach at Minzu University every, every September. That's the the ethnic university of China. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, so I see these things from, and boy, the Chinese, I tell you, they are working night and day. Mm. Uh, the work ethnic the, in the, among the young Chinese mm. students is just, it, ours, just our work ethic pales by comparison. Mm. So I think we're going to see, we've got to get ready for a world in which there's more alignment mm. of, of, of hegemony okay. and, and not Western hegemony, dominance. Mm. So I think that's what we have to think about and how do we prepare our, and I don't think that's bad. Right. right. Uh, and I think, how do we prepare students then to live in a world where there is shared dominance and shared coalitions and uh, where decisions are made not by the, just the Western nations, but also by the Western nations in the South. So I think that's the big challenge that we have to think about in our winter years. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. And do you see the possibility of Africa emerging as having a real voice in that? Or, or are they still going to be a silent I think, partner? I think there's a possibility. I think Africa is still struggling with many internal issues, but I certainly hope that Africa can, can come into that, that big table and be one of those nations that has a voice in, in Latin America and Africa. Right. Because I think that's really important. Yeah. And, and is that really just, you know, obviously it's complex, but we certainly know the huge wealth inequality that exists in those places. Um, and, and in essence, that's what we're, you're saying, the West versus, you know, the, the rest of the world in, in, in that sense. Um, how do we begin to equalize that? Is there a, a method that you can see for well, that. Well, first of all, I think we also have to recognize the wealth equality in the United States. Absolutely. Which is, uh, so it's a worldwide phenomenon, yes. the wealth in yes. inequality. And um, so first, I'd say recognize it there. Then, of course, we see it in developing nations, although Brazil is coming forward. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. been, I know that's not Africa, but, yeah, yeah. but Latin America also has a lot of poverty, as mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, but Brazil is, so I think Brazil provides an example for Africa. Mm -hmm that it is uh, really getting its act together. So I think it's really quite possible for, for nations in Africa to, to follow the example of Brazil, which is really uh, uh, coming forward. And of course, Mexico also is a, a possible nation that, this, that has the possibility to rise. So I think uh, we can look around the world and see that there are some examples that Africa can follow. But I think there are many challenges in Africa and other nations, and that there is a need for some kind of inequality, for some kind of equality, to emerge. But I think part of that, we're going to see an elite. The other problem related to that is the elite in the world mm. that that's emerging in all of these countries, and you can see that the elite in China, the elite. I haven't done that much work in Africa, but my guess is the elite in Africa. That that you see that as a global issue also. Right. Right. Ooh, complex world. Yes. Um, that that uh, is for sure. Um, anything else that you uh, want to just uh, spin here for us? In well, terms I want to congratulate you on the 20 years of the institute that you've been doing. 
here in Western Illinois, and I think that work is very important. And, and I just want to encourage and give, give a shout out to you for all the good work that you well, and Janice Welch have done in, in this, these institutes. I appreciate that. And um, it, it's always a pleasure. And once again, um, I've been um, uh, uh, a, a follower in that sense and um, always have been encouraged by you. And I want to thank you for those opportunities over the years. And um, I will continue reading you and uh, hopefully interacting with you. And thank so. you for inviting me here. I was greatly honored to, to be a speaker, to return after many years uh, to your institute. Very good. Thanks a lot. Thank you.